This year's Nobel Prize goes to neural networks in a very surprising twist. I had to make sure that this is not fake news, neither it is a parody. This year's Nobel Prize for physics actually goes to two scientists, John J. Hopfield and Jeffrey E. Hinton. So Jeffrey Hinton is a very popular name in the world of deep learning and neural networks. Back in 1980s, uh, when nobody believed in neural networks, there were very few people actually believed in neural networks and uh, Jeffrey Hinton is one of them. What is this neural network and physics? I started trying to read about it and then I found some fascinating details about why these two men have got the Nobel Prize for physics. Because see, in my mind, I'm not, I'm not that genius to understand all the things that happened before this. All I knew was like computer science was the primary factor for neural networks. But I think my perception has slightly shifted because of this and that is the information whatever I learned I wanted to share in this particular video. First of all, let's look at the press release uh, from the Nobel Prize Committee to understand why they have been given the Nobel Prize for physics and then we'll move on to understand what kind of contributions that they made that ultimately resulted in this particular Nobel Prize. In a short summary, they have said that the Nobel Prize in Physics 2024 was awarded to the John J. Hopfield and uh, Jeffrey E. Hinton for foundational discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. This entire thing is because they tried or they created this artificial neural networks. They train artificial neural networks using some fundamental concepts and core uh, concepts of physics. So this year's two Nobel laureates in physics have used uh, tools from physics to develop methods that are foundation of today's powerful machine learning. John Hopfield created an associative memory that can store and reconstruct images and other types of pattern and data. And this is called Hopfield network. This is like one of the first, very first artificial neural networks. These nodes influence each other. Imagine like these are like the neural networks, like the different nodes in a network. These nodes influence each other through connections that can be linked to synapses and which can be made stronger or weaker, kind of like weights. The network is trained, for example, by developing stronger connection between nodes with simultaneously high values. This year's laureates have conducted important work with artificial neural networks from 1980s onward. This is John Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton. So John Hopfield has created something called Hopfield network. This is like a neural network, a network that can, so it's called neural network primarily because, you know, they wanted to mimic human neurons, but technically this is a network like a graph networks. So this network can be used to store information. So kind of like a memory network. Now what Jeffrey Hinton came and did is Jeffrey Hinton came and took this particular network and created something called a Boltzmann machine. And uh, this is a concept that uh, Jeffrey Hinton and a bunch of others publicized a lot. So Jeffrey Hinton used Hopfield network as a foundation for a new network that uses a different method, the Boltzmann machine. This can recognize, learn to recognize characteristic elements in a given type of data. Hinton used uh, tools from statistical physics, the science of systems built from many similar components. The machine is trained by feeding it examples that are very likely to arise when the machine is run. For us, it's very easy to understand. If you want to create a language model, a large language model, you have to feed in a large amount of language into it, as we know. And that is exactly what they're saying. So the neural networks for it to work, the machine is trained by feeding in examples that are very likely to arise when the machine is run. The Boltzmann machine can be used to classify images or create new examples of the type of pattern on which it was trained. So you're creating new images, um, new examples, you can classify images. Hinton has built upon this work, helping initiate the current explosive development of machine learning. It just calls machine learning. It doesn't call it artificial intelligence, but um, that's, that's where we are today. Now, if you go slightly one level deeper into the paper, the very first paper, I think this came in 1985. This was published in Cognitive Science, a learning algorithm for Boltzmann machines. So this is by Jeffrey Hinton and uh, David Ackley. So the computational power of a massive parallel networks of simple processing elements reside in the communication bandwidth provided by the hardware connections between the elements. I think this is still true. These connections can allow a significant fraction of knowledge of the system to be applied 
to an instance of a problem in a very short time. One kind of computation for which massively parallel networks appear to well, I think even here, I'm not sure if they're called neural networks. I, I don't think, um, okay. They call it neuron like processing elements, as you can see here from a previous work from Hinton, but I'm not sure they call it uh, neural networks per se. There are some reference to neural networks uh, previously, but um, see here, the, the, the John Hopfield's neural networks and physical systems with emergent collective computational ab abilities. But if you see this paper, this paper mainly uh, alludes to whatever they are creating as a Boltzmann machine. So one kind of computation for which massively parallel networks appear to be well suited in a large constraint satisfaction searches, but to use the connections efficiently, two conditions must be best. First, a search technique that is suitable for parallel networks must be found. Second, there must be a way of choosing the internal representation which allows the pre-existing hardware connections to be used efficiently for encoding the constraints in the domain that is being searched. So it's like you have to have weights and you have to optimize the weights. We describe a general parallel search method based on statistical mechanics and we show that it leads to a general rule for modifying connection strengths. This is still what happens today in deep learning. We initialize with random weights and then we update the weights in every turn of training, every epoch, every training. And then we finally have the most efficient neural network by optimizing for the cost function. So leads to a general rule by modifying the connection strength as to incorporate knowledge about a task domain in an efficient way. We describe some simple examples in which the learning algorithm create internal representations that demonstrate that are demonstrably the most efficient way of using the pre-existing connectivity structure. So the neural networks, the nodes exist. It's just the weights that you optimize. Uh, it's like the layers that you've got, the weights that you optimize, and then you've got the neural networks. This is quite brilliant. I'm not sure how physicists would see this thing, to be honest. I mean, if I work in physics and I see that the Nobel Prize for physics is being given to, to computer scientists, it'd be pretty weird. Uh, but I never knew that, you know, uh, this kind of a back history that um, there is a physics uh, kind of an element to this thing. If you were to like exactly look at the connections of uh, neural networks and Hopfield network. So basically Hopfield network is a type of a recurrent neural network. So anything that you see in terms of RNNs, recurrent neural networks, you could always proceed it to say that, okay, Hopfield network is the first predecessor, like probably the oldest predecessor for what came to know, what we came to know as RNN, uh, recurrent neural networks. RNNs are kind of making a comeback nowadays. We have got like Mamba, the state space models and RNN was like a king back in the day. Transformers kind of came and took the entire show by itself. But RNN was like the big deal back in the day. So John Hopfield created Hopfield Network. It's, uh, it is designed to function as an associative memory system, meaning it can like recall stored problems. So that is exactly what we do in neural networks. That's in fact what we do in large language models even when presented with partial or corrupted inputs. So for example, you've got a, uh, let's say you've trained a neural network to recognize letters. You give a distorted J, it knows that it is J and then it can give you back the right J and that is what Hopfield network did. So some of the characteristics of Hopfield networks, it had binary nodes. So that is like zero or one, it had symmetric weights. Uh, it was always trying to uh, have a, an energy function that was minimizing. We call it a cost function now in the actual neural network. And finally, it had an associative memory. So you can see this pattern very similar to what we have in the current neural network. And uh, relation, the main relationship to the neural networks that we see today is that primarily it is the basis of modern RNNs, recurrent neural networks. And it also gave the ability for uh, other architectures to arise with the fundamental principles or the components that Hopfield used in Hopfield network. It's quite fascinating to see how two different fields could be correlated together. I guess probably Elon Musk would be very proud because he's a fan of physics and is doing a, a lot of work in AI with this XAI company and Tesla. So it's kind of weird to see that two computer scientists uh, whose work we discuss day in, day out in uh, on this channel and they got the Nobel Prize, but not for computer science, for physics. I mean, the last time I felt like this when uh, researchers uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Traversky got Nobel Prize for economics, even though they were not economists, they were like uh, psychology researchers. They created this uh, thinking uh, uh, first system, second system, 
and they got Nobel Prize for Economics and that gave a birth to a completely new field called Behavioral Economics. I'm not sure what is going to happen after this Nobel Prize, but at least I can be very sure that there'll be a lot of eyeballs and criticism on this particular award. I don't know what do you feel about it. Let me know in the comment section. See you in another video. Happy prompting.